Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. Spirit, fill me, O oh God, and help me in these next moments. Lord, would you please help everybody in this room to listen, Lord. Let us hear clearly and plainly without anything in the way. Thank you so much, God, for what we celebrate this time of year, the sending and the birth of your Son. Let us capture it in our hearts this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit and what it means for us in the here and now. This we ask through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week we talked about, we went all the way back to the beginning on the first Sunday of Advent, and we talked about what created this need for rescue that we all have so deeply. And I'm sure Adam and Eve wondered when they were thrown out of the garden. They probably wondered when Cain was born, their first son, if he was the one. Was he the fulfillment of the promise? Was he the offspring of the woman that would crush the serpent's head? But he wasn't. Cain was not going to undo the curse. In fact, Cain would murder their second son, Abel, which meant not only was Cain not the one, but Abel wasn't either. So it wasn't him. It wasn't Noah. So many years later, Noah sinned and then Noah died even after he built the ark and the Lord preserved him. It wasn't Abraham. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't Jacob. It wasn't even Joseph. They all lived and they did many great things for God, but they also sinned and so they died. And it wasn't even Moses after that. It wasn't even Joshua. It wasn't Samuel. They all died. The curse lived on. It kept spreading. Then David came and it looked awful promising for a while. But it wasn't him either. David proved to be a horrible sinner. Even the man after God's own heart. When would he come? When would the promise in Genesis 3.15 be kept because the curse wasn't going away. In fact, God created a whole nation that he called his son. So maybe a whole nation together, Israel as God's son, maybe they, if a, a group effort, all those people, maybe they could undo the curse, but they couldn't. In fact, that nation, that son, rebelled against God just like Adam had done, and they did it over and over and over again. And they were cast out from God for it. They as a whole were given over to their enemies. They split into two kingdoms eventually. Judah and Israel. There was divorce. There was conflict among the covenant people of God. And the prophet Isaiah this morning spoke God's word to Judah, the kingdom of Judah, through the lives of three of their kings for a very long time relative to how long prophets usually lasted. King Uzziah, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah from about 755 B.C. to 700 B.C. He warned the people in Jerusalem that horrible judgment was coming for Judah because they had disobeyed and dishonored the Lord about seven chapters into Isaiah's book. There was a conspiracy we find between the northern kingdom, Israel, and Syria against the southern kingdom, Judah. And God sent Isaiah to King Ahaz to encourage him to trust in God, but Ahaz wouldn't do it. The Lord gave him a sign anyway that a child called Emmanuel would guarantee Ahaz that Syria and Ephraim, their enemies, would be broken. God would raise up another nation, Assyria, to come and destroy them, but that nation would also descend on Judah. The northern kingdom will be destroyed by the Assyrians, which will bring about this thick darkness, Isaiah says. This is what God's son Israel knew. This is what the nation knew. It was what they were familiar with and dealt with all throughout their history. All throughout their history. Oppression, death, war, devastation, and eventually exile and slavery. The curse was in full swing. We needed rescued. And Isaiah also spoke of a child that was going to come. He picked up on the theme of the promise all the way back in Genesis 3.15 and began to fill it in a little bit more for God's people to see. And so God promised 
his old covenant people, that he would bring an end to their oppression, their rebellion against him had created. And the offspring God promised to rescue sinners would be a perfect king who will end the conflict and hostility brought about by the curse. So let's begin. I'm going to begin reading actually in chapter 8, verse 21, right near the end, and read down through 9-7 this morning. Listen to what Isaiah says about what is coming. They will wander through the land dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. Nevertheless, beginning here at 9-1, is one of Isaiah's very abrupt changes of direction in his book. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. Isaiah is seeing the future. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils, for you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us. So the promise of 315 is always waiting for a child to be born. The seed of the woman. A son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Back in chapter 8, Isaiah declared that the nation in whom Judah had trusted for deliverance, was going to turn against them. So he called on them to trust in God and to stir their faith and their hope. He pointed forward again to the coming Messiah in chapter 9. So all the hopes and dreams for the nation's deliverance focused on the coming of a promised child. Even though the people's refusal to trust their covenant God just like Adam's refusal to trust his creator had thrown the nation into complete darkness, Adam threw the whole world into darkness, all humanity. The nation is thrown into darkness, repeating his same sins and mistakes. But God would not leave them there. God didn't leave Adam there. He didn't leave Israel and Judah there. The region in the far north of Israel's territory. Zebulun, Naphtali, Galilee, where those Assyrian deportations started once they took over and invaded. Those people, the first ones to suffer from Assyria's onslaught, one day that place would see a great light. It would come all along the great highway of the sea that ran from the Euphrates River all the way to Egypt. There in that place, light was going to shine. And Isaiah said that God's people would erupt in joy because they would be delivered from their oppression in verse 4. It would be as awesome and decisive as when little Gideon defeated the Midianites. And they would be delivered from oppression because, we find in verse 5, that God is going to bring an end to all war. But how will God accomplish that? How will God end all the war and conflict and hostility that has been plaguing mankind since the beginning? through the birth of a child in verses 6 and 7. That child is going to solve everything. The offspring of the woman is going to fix everything when God keeps His promise. We find in Isaiah that even though mankind, even God's own covenant people abandon God, God has not abandoned us. He lets us know through His prophet in Isaiah, that he remembers his promise from Genesis 3. And he reiterates it here with a new promise that is going to 
that he's going to keep it. Our rescue will come. A child will be born. They were waiting and waiting and waiting. But this won't be just any child we begin to find out in Isaiah. It's not just going to be another offspring of a woman that's like all the other ones. He'll be divine, we find out. He'll be divine. And the deliverance of the nation, the rescue of God's people will come about through the work, through the agency of the child. That's why we have the word for at the beginning of verse 6. He will be why and how all this joy and how all this rescue comes. He will be a human descendant of David somehow, but also he will be mighty God. A human king, but not like the other kings. He will rule in justice and righteousness forever. His dominion will be vast. It will cover the earth. It will never end. Now those terms, those ideas create a problem because everybody just keeps dying. The kings are terrible. No good candidate has arisen or ever did among the line of kings that seemed fit to undo the curse, that seemed fit to save the people, that was never going to die, that was never going to be defeated, whose kingdom was never going to end. They never saw that. How can anybody fulfill this? What will have to happen for this to be fulfilled? This child, this son, this offspring, he will be the ultimate fulfillment of Emmanuel that was promised in chapter 7. That was most likely in its immediate context one of the sons of Isaiah. But the ultimate fulfillment, when he comes, he will be God with us a human and divine king and a completely perfect forever king. Look at his titles, right? Wonderful counselor, which means he will be completely qualified to rule. He will have all the wisdom necessary to do it well and to do it right. His person and power mean he can't be overcome. He can never be dethroned because he will be mighty God. And what will he be like to his subjects? How will he treat them? He will be an eternal father. Now who doesn't need that? And his rule will create perfect security for everybody over which he reigns. For he is also called the prince of peace. Which means no more upheaval, no more hostility, no more conflict, no more separation from God. But divine peace. This child is the prince of of it. That reign, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the eternal Father, the Prince of Peace, that is the reign that will never end. Paradise will return. That is the promise of rescue. The Son, this Son, will cause God's kingdom to spread and cover the earth. Do you understand The implications of that when we look back at Genesis 3 where Adam had failed in his commission to cover the earth with the paradise, with the kingdom of God, to extend the garden, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Remember, he failed. He was thrown out of paradise. He could not extend it. He brought a curse to the world. He brought death to the world where he failed in spreading the kingdom of God over the entire world. This child will succeed He will spread the dominion and kingdom of God all over the world. So God's purpose in creation will not ultimately be thwarted, not for Him and not for us. It will be accomplished just like God said through the seed of the woman, a child who will become a king to rule over the earth and bring all things back under God's dominion and end the curse. And look how it will be accomplished in verse 7. How can we know that one day, how could they know, how can we know that this promise is actually going to be kept? What's driving it? Who's responsible for accomplishing it? Whose power fuels it? Whose energy gives it life? The zeal of the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts will accomplish this.
because God is passionate. We normally don't think of God in those terms because we think of passion as something negative, and which is good because our passion tends to lead to negative things. But not when that passion is holy. Not when that passion is God-centered, when it comes from God himself who is passionate to keep his promise to break the curse. There is zeal, passion, emotion, fire in God to accomplish his redeeming promise. All the energy and effort and desire needed to accomplish salvation, God is supplying. We don't need to become more dedicated, committed people and make recommitment after recommitment after recommitment after recommitment to really get serious about the Lord. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish my salvation. And he will put that new government, the one that guarantees that God's dominion remains, he will put that new government on the shoulders of this king. This king will bear the weight of the world. This king will make sure that kingdom never ends. And he will make all things whole. This is God's gift to the world. We celebrate Christmas by remembering that not only did God make this promise, but God kept this promise. That's where we'll go, God willing, next week. And beloved, what this text means is that all the passion to achieve salvation, as, we've been, as I've been saying all the energy and strength and desire needed to accomplish this and end the curse and heal the world and make us whole, all rests in God Himself. When you're reading your Bible, always know your sentences. Who is the subject of the verbs? Who is doing what in this thing? And this is our hope this morning. This is our hope all year every year until God brings an end to human history. And what was inaugurated in the first coming of this child will be consummated when the king returns. And by way of application this morning, I just want us to find hope in the way this promise is described for us here. As biblical history moves, God goes from something very general and he gets progressively more specific about what the fulfillment of that promise, is, uh, that promise in Genesis 3.15 will look like. He fills it out over the course of history. And this morning for us to be able to see in how the promise is described here who this rescue will be for us. I think the text gives us four answers. If you are following along in the notes in your bulletin. This is where you can begin to fill in those blanks. First, he will be named Wonderful Counselor. Now let's just tease that out. In the midst of our confusion, everything that, that confuses us and makes it dark for us because of the curse, because of the fall, because of our own sinfulness, since we, are, we have inherited that curse. Every single person in this room inherited a curse that makes it impossible for us to clearly see what is true or to value what is actually real. We're all blinded. And in the midst of our confusion, our hope for understanding comes from the perfect counsel of Jesus. The great light that dawned in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali and Galilee, it dawned in that place because that was where Jesus set up shop when he came to our world. That region was the home base of his ministry. And that is who he still is for us. He is light in our darkness. His word is life that counsels and instructs and leads and sustains us. He is wonderful at caring for us. He is the source and the substance of all truth. And in Him alone are we truly counseled and truly made whole. Which is why if you ever end up in my office for counseling or with other believers in this place for counseling, the goal, I hope, is to make a beeline from where you are to Jesus. There's one wonderful counselor. And He is Christ. 
he will also be named Mighty God. Mighty God. So in the midst of this oppression, even though it's self-imposed, our hope for protection comes from the great power of Jesus who was God in human flesh and remains God in human flesh forever. We need somebody strong enough to break the devil's stranglehold on the world. We need someone that can undo all that plagues us. We need someone to secure salvation for us, to get it for us. But then we also need someone strong enough to keep it for us because we've proven It's in our DNA that if we get put in paradise and put where everything is perfect and put where everything is whole, we will mess it up and lose it. So we need somebody. We need a new Adam type. We need a new representative to come and secure all that God has freely given to us on our behalf so that it gets kept. And the mighty God, why is he mighty? Because he does that. We're incapable of keeping ourselves in God's good graces. And God has come in power, all His power, to rescue us in the person of Jesus Christ. He isn't doing it reluctantly. He isn't standing up for us and securing it for us reluctantly. His zeal is at work here. This is what God wants to do. God doesn't balance books and leave it be. He balances books to get us home, to get us close to Himself, to be our mighty God. in the person of Jesus Christ. So not only can He redeem us, but He can protect us until He gets us back to paradise. And He will also be named Eternal Father. Eternal Father. In the midst of this brokenness, our hope for love comes from the saving heart of Jesus. Jesus Christ will never, ever, ever stop loving the ones He saves. Not ever. And that love will never be begrudgingly given or reluctantly poured out For eternity, for eternity, He will be like a father to us, a perfect one, one unlike Adam, no matter how good his intentions ever became. I I want inside to love my four precious little children well, but I'm in the way. So I can love them and I can care for them and I can give them good things, but I am limited by what I am eventually. It's not an excuse. It's just a reality. There are no perfect eternal fathers in this world. But there is one. There is one. He will be a father to us much longer than we'd ever be able to keep ourselves in the family. This is a different father. This father, he won't bring a curse to the world. He'll bring peace to the world. This father, he won't bring chaos and death to our lives. He won't destroy us or tear us down. He'll make us whole and perfect forever. All that we long for and more, he will be. And finally, he will also be named Prince of Peace. In the midst of this conflict, this conflict, our hope for peace comes from the healing reign of Jesus. This king will not just end the curse. He will one day wipe away all of its effects And his sons and daughters won't even remember what it was like to hurt. That day is coming. Jesus has cornered the market on peace. 
And the closer we draw to Him as He is constantly in the Gospel drawing nearer to us, the more that peace will break into my now. He is the prince of the end and the absence of all hostility and conflict and brokenness. That is His reign. And because the prince of peace is seated right now at the right hand of God, Nothing will keep him one day from beginning or from bringing it to me in full. Nothing will keep him from bringing it to us in full who believe. In these four ways, at least, the promise of rescue will undo the curse. The wonderful counselor will answer all confusion The mighty God will overcome all weakness. The eternal Father will heal all brokenness. And the Prince of Peace will end the curse that killed us. That's the promise. That's the promise. The offspring God promised to rescue sinners will be a perfect king who will end the conflict and hostility brought about by the curse. What this text reveals is that the coming one will undo the curse because of who he is and how he will rule a new Adam over a new humanity, a new creation. He will be to God what Adam was intended to be but could not accomplish. This king is the offspring of the woman that will crush the serpent's head. This is him. And who will do it by dying for rebels. That's really the how. By dying for the rebels, by becoming the sacrifice. Masterfully then and decisively undoing Satan's whole plan. See, Satan knew that God was just. Satan knew that God was holy. So if he could tempt mankind to fall and rebel against God, he left God with one choice, to kill them because that's what he said he would do. So when they sinned and there was an instant death but a delay and a promise in that delay, Satan's knees began to shake because that wasn't what he expected. It turns out that the plan, the design is that God Himself would come down in the person of His Son and fully bear the punishment their sin deserved. What can Satan do if God Himself in the person of His Son steps in their place and takes their penalty? What can He do? Beloved, Advent celebrates the arrival of that King. Of that human being. Of God in the flesh. The embodiment of the promise that even though the turmoil and hostility and conflict around us rages, it's raging all the time. It's not going away. It's not, it doesn't matter who's running the country. It is not going away. It doesn't matter who's running our lives. It doesn't matter how much control we have over our lives. Conflict, hostility, brokenness, pain, suffering. We are under a curse. They are not going away. And only in the midst of all of this, there is only one that will hold fast. And His name is Jesus Christ. There's only one. God will bring His promise to completion in Him for us. And that promise is as sure as the dawn. As far as the curse is found. In every place. Under every rock. In every corner. The light is going to dawn. The King will return. Run to Him. Run to Him. Let's pray. Our Father, in what position would we be 
if we didn't have the words of Isaiah 9 or their fulfillment in Christ. There is only chaos and destruction apart from the child that was to be born and the son that was given. So Lord, this morning as we look at our own lives, as we look at the world immediately around us and then outside of that all around us, Lord, may we remember that there is one wonderful counselor, one mighty God, one eternal Father, one Prince of Peace. And may we throw ourselves on his mercy this morning and by his own word we will receive it no matter who we are or what we have done or how much the curse has broken us down. You, O oh God, can set us free because the payment required you took on yourself and paid in full. That's why salvation is available for all who call upon you, regardless of who they are or what they've done. It's who you are that secures the believing person even after they first believe. We all in this room need Christ equally and just as much to save and to keep us, Father. And you do both completely by your own zeal and your own passion to save, to fulfill your own promise. So, Lord, we praise you and we come running to you knowing that you'll receive us. Watch over us this morning, Father. As our ushers come, as we sing this last song, God be with us. When we give our money away, let us trust that we gain. We don't lose because we have you. May every dime of it be used in a way that honors and glorifies who you are and your purpose. Lord, may you own us completely. May we know you more and more every single day. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.